Welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast, brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk, in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Hey everyone, and welcome to the I Start Research Perspectives podcast, a place to combine the point of view of both someone living with dementia and a researcher on the same subject. Today we are going to talk about diet. And yes, I know I should redo mine, and probably this episode will highlight this even more. Numerous studies are linking what we eat to our brain health, indicating that healthier diets may reduce our risk for dementia. How strong this evidence is will be the focus of our conversation today. And just to remind you, on our virtual couch is my co-host, Clara Dominguez, a brilliant neurologist who tried to force me a healthier diet. Greetings, everyone. My name is Clara Dominguez. I work as a clinical neurologist in Spain, and I have had a personal interest in cognitive disorders since I started studying medicine. Now, as a clinician, I see everyday people with cognitive issues, and more and more, I am seeing people with a family history of dementia that come to my clinic quite worried about their brain health and asking what they can do now to prevent future cognitive decline. Diet is a key factor in prevention, so let's talk about it. Following, we will see two complementary perspectives on this subject. First, we will have the chance to talk with Dr. Claire McEvoy, who is a leading expert on dementia risk factors, particularly on diet and its effects on our brain health. We will discuss what are the best options science-wise in order to prevent cognitive decline. And then we will look through the eyes of the author and retired neurologist, Daniel Gibbs, who is living with Alzheimer's and for sure has also a lot to say about diet. So thank you so much for joining us today, Claire. I am sure our audience is eager to hear your expert opinion on the role of diet on brain health. Firstly, can you give us an overview of your research? Hello, Clara, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really happy to join the podcast today. And well, so firstly, you know, I've always been pretty much passionate about food and its effects on health. And I've been working in the field of public health nutrition for over 20 years. First as a clinical dietitian, which involved um, translating the most up-to-date scientific research on food, health and disease into practical everyday advice to, you know, to help support people to make appropriate food choices for their own health and well-being. And then as an academic nutrition scientist, and that's where I really developed a keen interest in understanding how nutrition, particularly uh, plant-based diets, impact on cognitive impairment and dementia risk. So, you know, we've been learning more and more that lifestyle could influence the onset and progression of Alzheimer's disease, and potentially 35 to 40 percent of dementia cases could be prevented or delayed by targeting modifiable risk factors. And many of these studies are showing that vascular disorders such as heart disease, as well as metabolic abnormalities such as obesity and, and diabetes are linked with the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. And of course, many of these cardiometabolic risks are influenced by our diet and what we choose to eat. But actually there are very few dementia researchers studying diet. So in my research, I examine links between different dietary patterns cognitive decline and dementia risk in, in population studies. And I also design and test diet and lifestyle interventions in people at increased risk of dementia to see what works for what subgroup of our population in, in what country. Um, so that's the an overview of my current research. Thank you, Claire. So I imagine uh, there are many diets that have been implicated in the progression or, or, or risk of dementia. So firstly, uh, could you tell us more about, for example, the MIND diet and what it entails, its history, and also the evidence base for it? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so MIND um, is an acronym for the Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurodegenerative delay. So it is a little bit of a, a mouthful, but um, luckily MIND is easy to remember. Um, so this is a diet that was developed by the late Martha Claire Morris from Rush University in Chicago. And Dr. Morris and her research group combined elements from the DASH diet, and this is a diet that's used to lower blood pressure and treat hypertension, and also then the Mediterranean diet, which is more of a cultural diet model, but shown to be strongly cardioprotective. So it's sort of a, a mash of these two very um, important uh, healthy dietary patterns for, for um, cardio protection, and then also amend to incorporate the latest evidence on specific nutrients and foods that are shown to be important in the diet and dementia field. So uh, for example, the Mediterranean and DASH diets recommend around four daily servings of vegetables. But the observational data that we have suggests benefits of around two servings a day of vegetables for brain health. But actually the type of vegetables that people were eating are, act are really important. So green leafy vegetables like cabbage, kale and spinach appear to have to give the greatest protection against cognitive decline and dementia. And then another important difference in the mind diet is for fruit intake. So Mediterranean and DASH diets recommend at least two portions of, of fruit per day. But fruit has not been consistently related to cognition in the evidence base. Um, and so when the evidence was reviewed, it shows that the type of fruit is important for, for the brain and suggests that there are two servings of berries, uh, like strawberries and blueberries provided neuroprotection. So in terms of the diet itself, it has 15 components. So there are 10 recommended brain healthy components, and these are leafy green vegetables, other vegetables and berries. And then in addition to that, we've got whole grains, beans and pulses, nuts, olive oil as, in, as the primary source of fat in the diet, fish and moderate intakes of poultry and wine if enjoyed. And then five unhealthy components are those that are typically high in saturated fat and, and refined sugars that we know are detrimental for brain health. And they're advised to be eaten in limited amounts. And these are butter, cheese, processed meats, fried foods, and confectionery. And then when we look at the evidence, it's mostly observational data that we have at the moment, but Greater adherence to the MIND diet has been associated with slower cognitive decline and around 50% reduced Alzheimer's disease risk in the Chicago Memory and Aging Project. And what's also really interesting is that people didn't need to have perfect compliance with the diet. So even moderate compliance showed a protective effect on the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And we, and others have shown the benefits of the MIND diet on cognitive performance in other population studies. Of course, correlation from observational data doesn't necessarily mean causation. And we have very few clinical trials um, studying diet in the dementia field. However, there is a, a large three-year multi-center randomized controlled trial that is currently being conducted in the USA, and it's evaluating the effect of the MIND diet on cognitive decline in um, a large group of older people who are at cognit a cognitive risk. So we hope these findings will be published soon and be able to tell us a little bit more about how adopting the MIND diet can impact on cognitive function. Thank you so much. I think MIND is a really catchy name. And I, and I think the diet sounds delicious from my point of view, so I don't think it's a problem to follow it. But anyway, there are many other diets uh, we hear implicated, though, including some restrictive ones like the ketogenic diet. So what other diets have a good evidence base? And is there any that where, where maybe the, this evidence is lacking? 
So plant-based diets, I think plant-based diets are really important for um, and probably or will be more effective for people who have not, where cognitive impairment has not become apparent yet. So mostly for primary prevention, but there is interest in developing more targeted dietary approaches particularly to delay the progression of cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. And um, we know that the brain is a very you know, highly metabolic organ. It uses up around 20% of our daily energy intake, preferably in the form of glucose. But glucose uptake can become impaired in the aging brain. And we see accelerated decline in glucose uptake and insulin resistance um, in cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. So dietary ketones, um, particularly beta-hydroxybutyrate, can still cross the blood-brain barrier and provide an alternate source of energy for the brain and Alzheimer's disease. And the ketogenic diet um, is a high-fat, low-carb, very low-carb diet that stimulates ketone production in the body. So experimentally providing ketones um, have been shown to decrease amyloid accumulation, neuroinflammation and insulin resistance. And there are some human studies suggesting cognitive benefit of adopting a ketogenic diet or taking a ketogenic supplement. But the evidence is largely inconsistent so, for example, in a well-conducted randomized controlled trial, there was no cognitive benefit of ketone supplement in mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease patients. But on the other hand, in older adults with mild cognitive impairment, ketone su supplement significantly improved cognitive functions um, in the domains of memory, executive function, and, and language. What we have to remember is that there are you know, the, 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 this is an emerging research area. The, the ketogenic diet studies that are performed have mainly been in small samples, and these are the human studies. The trials have been of short duration, and there have been variable doses of ketones which have been examined. So that makes it really difficult to know if ketogenic approaches can be beneficial for people, particularly those with cognitive impairment. We really need large scale interventions of sufficient duration to test these out in humans. And, you know, coming from the, the clinical perspective, the, the, my dietetic background, the diet is very restrictive. So it is difficult to adhere to in the longer term. And that could be also a problem when testing it out in research studies. And there are concerns about using ketogenic diets for older people. So, while you know, it can provide sufficient amount of calories, extreme carbohydrate restriction can reduce diet quality. Low carb diets are often low in B vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin E, and important minerals um, such as calcium, magnesium, and iron. So you know, following these restrictive diets could increase the risk of nutritional deficiencies for older adults. And longer term effects, it could, could be things like anemia, which may, may not be good for brain health. And then as well as low bone mineral density, higher cholesterol levels and, and kidney problems. So we need to be able to test these dietary strategies out um, and also minimize the potential adverse effects when using ketogenic approaches for dementia. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, definitely, it sounds uh, much more difficult to stick to uh, these this restrictive uh, approaches. So as well as many foods and diets are being proposed as beneficial or detrimental, there is also many pathways proposed for why they may have such effects. For example, I've heard about how the benefits of diet may stem from its influence on inflammation and also cardiovascular health. Uh, could you tell us more about why certain foods or diets are thought to be protective? I think we don't know for sure, but we're beginning to understand more about the mechanisms of how specific foods and dietary patterns affect cognitive health. 
and really from a range of studies conducted in the lab, in animals, and also in humans. So we know that plant-based diets are rich in antioxidant vitamins like vitamin A, um, and as well as other brain healthy nutrients, including B vitamins, selenium, folate, plant bioactives like polyphenols, and also long chain omega-3 fatty acids. And as mentioned earlier, um, fish is an important component of a brain healthy diet. So oily fish like salmon, trout, mackerel are rich sources of omega-3 fatty acids, especially uh, docosahexaenoic acid or DHA for short. And this is highly abundant in the brain and important for neuronal cell function. So high DHA obtained from fish, and importantly fish not from supplements, has been associated with improved cognitive health and reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease. So we do recommend uh, two weekly servings of oily fish. Olive oil is another major component of a brain healthy diet and is high in anti-inflammatory polyphenols and also really healthy monounsaturated fats. So olive oil reduces amyloid in animal models of AD and greater consumption of olive oil has been associated with protection against cognitive decline in older adults. And then, so those are some of the good things, but it, on the other hand, dietary saturated fats and refined carbohydrates like sugars are shown to be neuroinflammatory and, and detrimental to neuronal cell function. So I suppose the message is that different foods and nutrients can affect inflammation, oxidative stress, blood flow to the brain, as well as neuronal cell function. But of course, we don't just eat you know, one food or, or one nutrient. So perhaps the balance of our diet is most important. And in our studies, we find that individual food components on their own tend to have weaker associations with cognition compared to the overall dietary pattern. So the combination of foods and nutrients within our diet, like the MIME diet, for example, can act synergistically to have greater biological effects in the brain. So yes, diet like Daesh, Mediterranean and mind can improve our vascular function and inflammation and they've been linked to also more favorable brain uh, structures and functions that protect against cognitive decline in, in the aging brain. Greater adherence, I mean the Mediterranean diet is probably the most widely studied in this field and greater adherence to the Mediterranean diet is associated with lower rates of brain atrophy, better structural connectivity, and also less amyloid accumulation. Um, but again, the data hasn't been entirely consistent. And I don't, I don't think we can leave this uh, uh, conversation without mentioning the gut microbiome, because there's a lot of interest in the gut microbiome and its links to brain health. And as we get older, you know, the bacterial community in our gut becomes less diverse, and also pathogens that um, can increase which have been implicated in the development of Alzheimer's disease by initiating and exacerbating neuroinflammatory processes. So diet can really influence the composition of the gut microbiome. And there has been one European study called New Age where adoption of a Mediterranean diet was associated with more favorable gut microbiome, uh, microbiome profile reduced inflammatory markers and also better cognition. Um, so, you know, we are learning that dietary patterns can work through several mechanisms to influence brain health, but we need to study these more comp comprehensively. As I said, there's very few intervention studies in this field, and we do need intervention studies to better examine the mechanistic effects of dietary modification on uh, cognitive outcomes to really understand the full picture. Yeah, the full picture seems very, very complicated, but we have great people working on it. <laughs> so we have discussed the evidence base, but we know putting theory into practice in our lives can be easier said than done. So uh, these uh, dietary approaches can be especially hard for those who may lack their resources in terms of time or money. So do you know if there's any research under place to help ensure that all have accessible and sustainable choices for their diets? 
Yes, completely agree. Um, this, while it is important to generate, you know, the robust evidence base of what works, it is really difficult for people in real life to change their dietary habits. And so a key challenge from a research perspective is to find effective ways to support dietary behavior change for dementia prevention. And I think that's um, somewhat lacking in our, in our focus at the moment. However, one of the key barriers that we have found in our population is uh, cost of a healthy diet. Um, and that comes up pretty consistently um, as a barrier to adopting some of the key food components like vegetables, fish, nuts, olive oil, for example. A healthy diet, it does cost more, but it can be achieved even on a limited budget. And we have, we have worked a lot with um, study participants to develop resources that can help with this, overcome this barrier to achieving a healthy balanced diet. So things like frozen fruits and vegetables can be a really economical choice. Also a practical choice because they can be easily portioned. They require little preparation and you don't have to worry so much about the high price when items such as berries, for example, are in season or how they may you know, perish easily before you can use them up. So frozen fruit and vegetables are, are a great choice. They're a healthy choice and you can add an extra serving into uh, of vegetables into soups and, and stews and, and the green leafy vegetables and pasta dishes to really bump up the vegetable intake. Also um, canned and frozen varieties of oily fish are perfectly acceptable sources of omega-3 fats and they're cheaper than some of the fresh fish varieties. So canned fish are you know, really versatile for things like sandwich fillings, pizza toppings, we use them in salads and pasta bakes. Um, and then, you know, some people, uh, particularly people who are involved in our studies, they report things like dental and chewing problems, and they, they often find nuts difficult to eat. So natural nut butters, like almond butter, for example, can be a very easy and acceptable way to increase the intake of, of natural nuts in the diet. So our studies, you know, at mid and older age have shown that it is achievable to eat a Korean healthy diet and maintain it longer term, even if there are budget and time constraints. And some of the facilitators to changing diet behavior in our studies um, were the provision of individualized dietary advice, written education, meal plans, shopping tips, recipe ideas. And all of those things can help support people to really translate the recommendations into their daily routine. Yeah, definitely there are many, many options. And of course, a personalized um, counsel uh, could help. Well, uh, Claire, thank you again for participating in this podcast. We hope this shared knowledge would help improve our dietary habits and therefore our present and our future. Thank you very much. Thank you. to have you with us dr gibbs can i call you dan of course so dan, yeah. could you please briefly introduce yourself yeah I, i'm a retired neurologist i was a general neurologist in portland oregon for 25 years uh i also have a phd but uh, uh that was in brain science but I, I generally just saw all, all comers uh but i did have a lot of dementia patients uh, while i was um uh, while I was practicing neurology. Um, and uh, I really had no idea of being on the Alzheimer's spectrum uh, until I accidentally discovered I was a, a homozygote for APOE4. I had two copies of the APOE4 allele. And both of my parents had died in mid age from cancer. So uh, there was no clear family history of Alzheimer's. Uh, but that certainly got my attention. And then, in, in, so that was in 2012. And in retrospect, um, I think my first symptoms of Alzheimer's were back in 2006. So um, six years earlier, when I started to lose my sense of smell and began to have um, what are called phantosmias. They're, they're stereotypical 
olfactory, uh, not really hallucinations, they last longer than olfactory hallucinations. Uh, but that probably was the first uh, uh, sign of Alzheimer's, although I didn't make that connection at the time at all. Uh, my, my diagnosis uh, didn't come until 2015 uh, as part of a study at the University of California of San Francisco, uh, where they were testing a then new uh, uh, tau ligand uh, for PET scanning. Uh, and uh, I had two days of, of, of uh, cognitive testing and a tau pet and an amyloid pet. That was the PIB scan uh, uh, there. And the amyloid scan was positive, uh, showing amyloid in um, my prefrontal lobes, uh, uh, precuneus, uh, and interestingly also in the piriform cortex in the mesial orbital frontal cortex which are areas involved with higher processing of olfaction. So that was kind of cool. And, and we all kind of you know, looked at those scans and, and had, our, had our scientists hats on. We're thinking this is pretty neat. The, the tau at that time in 2015, the tau pet just showed the beginning of abnormal tau uh, in the mesial temporal lobes more on the left. Then when those scans were repeated, uh, three years later, the tau had spread contiguously back into the posterior temporal lobes uh, bilaterally, and there was a lot more amyloid than there had been three years earlier. But so my diagnosis in 2015 was mild cognitive impairment due to, due to Alzheimer's pathology. You know, Dan, uh, I never interviewed a medical doctor or a scientist that is living with dementia, so that's, that's a different point of view for me. And then we are talking here about diet and, and its influence in Alzheimer's and dementia in general. Can you please tell us how was your diet like before being diagnosed? Yeah, you know, it, it actually fortunately was pretty good. Uh, my wife and I gave up eating beef 20 years ago. Uh, mainly for political reasons uh, around the, well, let's just say that, that for a number of reasons we gave it up. And health was not the major one at the time, but by serendipity, that was just you know, a very good thing to do. Uh, but we, we also ate pretty much a plant-based diet uh, regularly with uh, a little bit of pork and lamb, and, and, but mainly ch uh, chicken and, and fish and, and turkey as a uh, uh, meat sources, uh, and we ate salad every night. So that really wasn't that, that, uh, it was, it was a pretty good diet. It wasn't your typical American, you know, T-bone steaks or hamburgers all the time. Although I have to say that, that, uh, uh, I did get my share of French fries that probably weren't that, that great for me. Um, but, but that changed, uh, you know, once I found out that I had Alzheimer's, then I started, you know, digging in with my scientist hat and seeing, you know, what was important. And so in 2015, you know, the, the first paper uh, uh, from the Rush group on the MIND diet came out and, and caught my attention. Uh, and and I, I have to say that I've been a pretty, pretty good, I, I'd say on the high side of conformity to the MIND diet ever since 2015. It's gotten even better because my, my one weakness uh, that I had a heart, that I really didn't give up was cheese. And, and, and dairy is not uh, part of the mind diet. And, and you're only allowed, I think, one serving of cheese per, per week. And that, that, I was violating that. And then just recently, I've developed lactose intolerance, so I've, I've had to give up dairy. So that's been great uh, because that's, that's, now I'm a, a strict adherer, adherent to the, the MIND diet. Uh, and and you know, I have to say uh, that the MIND diet for me has not been hard. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the, the vegetables uh, that are recommended are not ones that are on most people's favorite vegetable list because they tend to be bitter. Um, but for me, uh, you know, I think because of my loss of smell and consequent loss of taste discrimination, I actually like things that are bitter now. Uh, and so I, I eat kale every day and I eat it raw um, and cooked. 
And that probably is, is the highest you know, reasonable thing, uh, at least uh, the highest content of, of, of uh, flav uh, flavanols, uh, which are felt to be a, a, a strong component of why the MIND diet works. Uh, I think I've wandered off from the question <laughs> that you had. <laughs> no worries. And why MIND diet in particular? And I, and I was imagining here then, uh, for instance, I am I am 30 years old now, uh, but, but who is counting? And if I change my diet today towards the MIND diet, what impact do you think this would have on my life in general? Okay. Well, you know, the, the one message I am trying to get out to people is that uh, lifestyle changes uh, really do work for reducing the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. And there's really good data for all of them, but particularly for exercise and for diet. But they have to be started early. So you know, by the time you have dementia, they don't really add much. Uh, and I wouldn't discourage people from doing it, but you know, in, in for exercise in particular, you know, in the studies that have, have looked at the effects of aerobic exercise in people who already have dementia really haven't shown any benefit but it's the people who don't have the dementia yet, who are still have, have MCI, or, and this is the key thing in your case, is a family history of, of dementia. Uh, so, uh, you know, my, I, I would recommend that people who have a first degree relative with Alzheimer's disease, or for that matter, any other neurodegenerative disease, because diet seems to be important for Parkinson's as well. Um, so I would recommend that at least by midlife, they should making, start making an effort of, they don't have to be 100% in, but doing everything they can to reduce their risk going forward. And that includes going on a, a more plant-based diet and, and, and getting the, the aerobic exercise and getting enough sleep. And of course, that's hard in midlife because we're, that's the busiest time of our life. We've got a job, we've got kids, we've got a lot on our plate. And, uh, but I think it's, it's important for people to realize that, that that's the time uh, to really start intervening. Maybe not at 30, but I would say by 40 or 50. Yeah, well, but, but it, it's good to start early, right? <laughs> I need that's to start right. Some... That's right, it can't hurt. <laughs> it, start, to, start developing that taste for kale. <laughs> okay, I will try, I, I promise I will try. <laughs> but then how easy, was to shift your diet because well I'm, I'm giving a little bit of my perspective as well so i tried a zillion of diets in my life mm -hmm. i'm only 30 but i tried a zillion and uh, trying something new is not really hard but sticking to it after one week or one month that's the hardest part so how was for you to change some aspect well it, uh not as hard as you might think, because, and I think you know, this is just opinion, I can't point to any, any research to support this, but um, the fact that I can't smell, I have absolutely no sense of smell now, and my, my taste is limited to distinguishing you know, salt, uh, sweet, uh, sour, I don't think I have much umani uh, uh, taste left, uh, so pretty much everything tastes the same. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's bad in some sense, but uh, it, it, uh, it, it makes it easier to, to, to ch make changes in diet uh, because uh, I actually enjoy the bitter taste now because I really can, can, can get it. Uh, for example, with beer, uh, you know, I've really gone to, to uh, you know, a high bitterness, uh, you know, like the IPAs and things like that. I, I much prefer to a sweeter beer because I can really taste it. Uh, and, and, you know, on wine, for example, I mean, we're allowed to have one glass of wine on the MIND diet. And uh, I don't have to wait, I don't waste money on expensive wine because they all taste the same to me. Um, so uh, I, I, as long as it doesn't have an acid flavor, uh, then I can still enjoy it. So I guess, you know, that's, that's one of the blessings of, of losing your sense of smell is that uh, it's not easy, it's not hard to to get on a diet that it might not be as tasty as what you're used to. Yeah, well, we have another another something in common. I also don't spend a lot of money on expensive wines, but maybe not for the same reason. But <laughs> <laughs> but I also 
I'm also drinking cheap wine. So you're a medical doctor yourself, but I'm just wondering here how your physician approach your diet after being diagnosed. Um, they tried to make any changes or no one talked about, about it? Yeah, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm really a, a, a special case in that, uh, you know, it's been, the, the beauty of, the, of being a neurologist with Alzheimer's disease is that it allows me to step back and approach it intellectually, which is a real uh, important defense mechanism. Uh, and, and my interactions with my, my doctors has been more as uh, colleagues, you know, rather than a, as a, a doctor patient thing. So uh, we come up with ideas together, but uh, you know, it, it's, it's not really a typical doctor patient relationship. So I would have to say that I, I haven't had my, I don't think any of the neurologists that I've seen have mentioned diet because they know what I'm already already doing that and I've already written about it. So, you know, it's a big thing for me. Yeah, so you're always one step ahead. I, I don't know if I'd say that, but uh, maybe one step ahead and, and two steps behind and other things. Yeah. And uh, this phrase of yours was amazing. The beauty of being a neurologist with Alzheimer's. Do you think I still have time to become a neurologist? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> As I do have a family history on Alzheimer's, maybe I should. Well, you know, maybe maybe you should be getting out there and, and doing some running if you're not already, or, or at least some walking and, and uh, eating a better diet. <laughs> okay, well, I'll try. I, I promise that as well. So okay. then how the modifications in your diet it affect your mood and energy throughout the day and your sleep at night? You know, I, I don't know that I could say that modifications in my diet that have had a noticeable effect in any of those things, uh, except that it's part of the global thing of, of, of knowing that I'm doing the right thing uh, to stave off Alzheimer's as long as possible. I mean, look, if, if, if truly the, my first symptom of Alzheimer's was back in 2006, I still test in the mild cognitive impairment range, even though I've got tau and amyloid all through my brain. So um, I don't have dementia yet. Uh, you know, I'm getting there, but very, very slowly. And, and I can't help but think that that's uh, due at least in part uh, to the diet and the exercise and the sleep. You know, I do, I follow all these things very religiously. The thing I have the hardest time with among the, the recommended lifestyle changes is social engagement. Because uh, uh, for, for most people with Alzheimer's disease, uh, being social becomes very difficult. You know, part of that is, is um, uh, a, a degree of apathy that's common with the frontal lobe damage that occurs early. Uh, but a big part of it, and I've spoken to other people with Alzheimer's about this, is that it becomes really difficult to, um, to follow multiple conversations. So, so uh, if you're in a social gathering, even a, a family dinner thing, and several people are speaking, I can't sort them out. Uh, and, and I think that's because uh, I think our brains tend to... Uh, uh, parse a, a, a sentence that, that we hear such that we don't have to hear every word. We can fill it in by context if we didn't hear something. I can't do that anymore. So for example, uh, my wife has gotten to the habit of when she starts to tell me something, she'll repeat the first sentence or first part of it because until I lock in on what she's trying to say, I can't understand it. Uh, I can no longer supply missing words by context. So that's another thing that makes you know, social engagement fraught. Uh, and, uh, and I work on that. I mean, I, I try to, to, uh, to uh, you know, talk to neighbors. You know, another aspect of Alzheimer's that I've written about uh, is face blindness. It, it's very common in Alzheimer's uh, even early on. And I have it you know, moderately severely where I can't tell my neighbors apart sometimes. And that happened just the other day that I mixed up two neighbors who look a little bit alike. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's, it can be embarrassing, but um, 
Oh, I've wandered totally off what you ever asked me. Uh, so I'll, I'll let you get, get us back on track. <laughs> and I, I totally relate to that, um, trying to go back to the time I was caring for my grandma because diet and, and food in general is not just for feeding your body, but also it, it's a social uh, mm -hmm. Um, it's a social time for you to sit in the table, to talk to your family, to talk to your friend, to talk to your neighbors, perhaps to go out, to go to a restaurant. So it's a social moment as well. And I saw that my grandma was facing uh, a lot of challenges in the beginning. So she was preferring to have her meals alone. And then we discovered that something was going on and we tried to adapt all our family and our routine to, to, to be a better moment for her for her to engage with us. And, and then in my case, I, I don't have much time to cook because of work and not just me, I am pretty sure. And healthy foods are basically too expensive where I live. So there is a push for certain diets with oil seeds and types of fish, but that in some parts of the world can be very frustrating because of the cost impact. Yeah. Do you have any advice for other families, other uh, people that are maybe hearing us right now that want to change their diet, but with few resources? Well, you know, I, I, I think there is pretty good evidence that, uh, that that doesn't have to be a problem. Uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the, the words for the, you know, there, there are a number of places in the world where people live a long time, like into their hundreds. I'm, the blue zone, right? Thank you. And and uh, uh, there have been people that their diets have been studied, and these are not, for the most part, these are not in prosperous parts of the world. Uh, and uh, whatever they're doing, they're they're doing right, <laughs> and in terms of being a healthy diet. So I don't I don't think it's necessarily true that it has to be expensive or. Uh, uh, and, and and I, I can't remember all the details of the various blue zone diets, and they're they're a little bit different, but they share a lot in common, even though they come from different parts of the world. So I'm, I'm sure you guys are or somebody there is much more expert on that than I am. But but I I, I don't buy your your, your argument that um, that it's too expensive to to jump on board. You know, the one thing I worried about a little bit was uh, I do eat fish every day, uh, which is part of the Mediterranean diet. It's not part of the mind diet. And I started to worry a little bit about, you know, whether I was poisoning myself with mercury. So I actually got my mercury levels checked uh, and they're fine. You know, they're, they're not, not a worry at all. Cause I, I, for lunch every day, I have either, uh, canned tuna or you know canned salmon on a salad or in a sandwich uh and it just kind of i thought you know gee you know i wonder if i'm just eating too much of that stuff because uh, of the mercury issues but uh, at least for me that was not, in, not not a problem yeah you're right maybe i'm too lazy <laughs> <laughs> but you know what when i was living in dublin for a year uh food there and and the cost impact of having a healthier diet was so different than in brazil Eating mm. fish every day was a reality there rather than in Brazil, which is kind of crazy. And, mm. and, and now I am in the exact moment in Costa Rica. I'm very close to one of the blue zones and I'm planning to go there next oh, week. So yeah, it's a good timing to mention that because I will be paying attention in the diet. And mm. let's see what they're eating there because I want to live 100 as well. So then um, a last question for you. The audience here for this podcast are primarily early career researchers. And well, at least we expect them to be listening. So do you have any message or question for them? Mm. Well, I, I would uh, give them the same message that I gave you that uh, uh, they shouldn't assume that Alzheimer's only strikes the, the elderly because uh, Alzheimer's disease if you allow me to call it that, starts 20 years before there's any cognitive impairment. And in my view, and this is not universally held, but uh, I think the pre-symptomatic stage of Alzheimer's is going to be where we have the most success early on. It certainly is the time when 
when the lifestyle modifications are probably most likely to be beneficial. And uh, my bias is that, that our first successful drugs uh, for Alzheimer's will be most effective in the pre-symptomatic or first, firstly symptomatic stage, the you know, mild MCI. Uh, and, and that's something I'm, I'm passionate about in trying to get that message across. And, and to the young investigators, um, you know, think about that, that it's, it's, uh, you're not invincible at, at 30. Uh, you may feel like it, but uh, now's, now's the time to start making uh, uh, some changes. And, and if it's only to exercise regularly, which is, is great, but, but also watching that diet. And, and starting to look uh, research-wise at uh, the early stages of, of Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's risk, which of course is, is a very complicated issue. Yeah, I completely agree because I feel so frustrated when I am talking and giving a lecture or something and, and, and I see that society still perceives Alzheimer's as an old people's matter and actually when you bring this kind of message that it starts 20 years uh, before any symptom, so you can see that it's not an old people matter. So you, you need to, to be worried your entire life with your habits, perhaps, and changing that to avoid being diagnosed or at least to delay it a little bit, right? And, and, and I, should, I should add, because I think I forgot to say this, I'm, I'm sure all your listeners should know this, but what I meant by saying that Alzheimer's disease starts 20 years early, earlier than cognitive impairment, that means that the amyloid plaques and even neurofibrillary tangles are starting during that period, years before there's any cognitive impairment. Exactly. Well, Dan, thank you so much for sharing your story and your brilliant knowledge with us. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society. Supporting early career dementia researchers across the world.